We'll be talking about P4. Uh, first things first, this talk is RFC 1925 compliant. Uh, I've been deploying and operating service provider networks for about 13 years professionally uh, of various sizes in various places in the world. Uh, if you're not familiar with RFC 1925, do look it up. It's one of those timeless RFCs. Um, I represent myself. Uh, I'm self-employed. Uh, if I'm a shill for anything, it is BSD. This talk is about SDN. Um, I know that elicits a lot of groans, you know, still does nothing, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we've heard. Um, this is about software defining networks. So let's get a working definition of what SDN is, right? Because it's been beaten to hell and back by marketing and sales. It means everything and nothing all at once. So for the purposes of this talk, let's have a real simple definition of SDN. Let's separate the control plane from the data plane, right? Instead of having a distributed control plane, we have a logical centralized one. We separate the two. Everyone's familiar with that. Second one, an open and consistent API to the data plane. Now, with those two properties, that sounds kind of familiar, right? Kind of sounds like OpenFlow. All right, well, OpenFlow did separate the control plane from the data plane. Got deployed. You can have centralized controllers. But what about the second part? an open and consistent API to it. When OpenFlow first came out, it understood four things, IPv4, ACLs, Ethernet. By the time we got to OpenFlow 1.5, there were 45 different parsers. And as OpenFlow got more and more complex, vendors just decided to implement parts of it, not all of it. And now all of a sudden, well, this box supports this OpenFlow, this box supports that OpenFlow, minus this, plus that. It wasn't consistent, despite being open. So for our purposes, OpenFlow doesn't really meet the definition of software-defined networking. So what does? You can guess it, P4. Uh, it gets its name from Programming Protocol Independent Packet Processors. Uh, it was developed uh, from a lot of the same people that did OpenFlow, uh, but it is not OpenFlow. So first things first, let's get some unfortunate common misconceptions out of the way. P4 is a programming language, but it is not a general purpose programming language. You would not use P4 to write a BGP daemon or a netconf interface. It is specific to packet forwarding and data planes. The computation and memory is bounded. There are no for, for loops. There's no memory management, none of those things. It looks like the C language, but it has none of those, it has none of those things. A lot of people think P4 is only for barefoot Tofino switches. If you've heard of P4, you've probably heard of barefoot Tofino, the 6.5 terabit per second fully programmable switching ASIC. Yeah, it's cool. They're obviously a big supporter of P4. But P4 is applicable, as we'll see hopefully in this talk, uh, to a lot more than just barefoot Tofino switches. And one point I would really, really like to drive home is the last one. P4 is not OpenFlow 2.0. It's completely false, just wrong. It's not OpenFlow 2.0. So what is P4? It is a domain-specific language. It is only for data plane programming. It is only for parsing and forwarding packets. And it does this with three overarching goals for the language. It specifies packet forwarding behavior, how a packet gets forwarded through a pipeline. And one of the nice things about this is that it allows you to reconfigure things after you've deployed it. It's not static. P4 is a language designed with no specific protocol in mind. So if you can represent it as a packet or a frame, P4 can represent it. It's not beholden to just Ethernet or V4 or V6 or MPLS. If you want to come up with your own artisanal labeling protocol, you can do that. You can write that in P4. So it's completely independent of the protocols. It's also target independent. So whatever the underlying hardware is, P4 doesn't really care. P4 doesn't constrict you to a generic CPU or a specific switching ASIC. And as we'll see later, you can run it on a whole wide variety of things. So when I talk about a packet forwarding plane, and some of you may be familiar with this, but in order to kind of have a base, let's generalize it. A packet comes into a device. What's the very first thing that happens when it hits the interface? We have to parse it. We have to understand the headers from it. So let's see, can the pointer work? Yeah, there we go. 
we have our parser. That's the first stage. That takes the packet, grabs headers out, gets some metadata. Now what do I do with those values from the header? Well, I have a match action table. Those headers get matched to something. It gets looked up in a table. That table says, when this matches, I have an action. Then the action goes and does that. Now, you can have, theoretically, as many, you can do this as many times as you'd like, once, twice, 10 times. The language and the general idea of it has no real constraint other than hardware. Once that's all done and you've gone through the pipeline, you send it out. You deparse it, you queue it, and you send it out of the device. This is the generalization that we've come to in, in P4. Uh, if you're familiar with gaming and uh, way back in the day, like 3DFX had those voodoo graphics cards, and they were specific to graphics. That's all they did, OpenGL, DirectX. And then all of a sudden, we have these generic graphics processing units. And now they, do, they don't even do games anymore. They do machine learning. This is the same thing that's happening in networking now with Tofino and other things. We have a generalized idea of what we can do with the pipeline. And so we follow this kind of, this kind of model. And towards the end, you'll see it gets really weird what we can do. I'm going to try to introduce the P4 language to you. It is a programming language. Kind of tough to introduce a programming language in 10 minutes or less. I would like to leave some time for questions. So I apologize if this is quick and it doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm doing my best here. If you're familiar with P4, it's been around for almost four years. There's a couple of versions of it. The only one anyone should really care about, unless you're already running P4, which would kind of shock me, but cool, uh, is P4.16. It's the latest one. It's kind of considered the version 1.0. It takes a new approach. So if you read about P4 a year ago and probably thought, oh, that's weird, oh, this doesn't really apply, they fixed a lot of that stuff. And so P4 introduces this approach of a target, an architecture, and a platform. Now, a target is the device I'm actually using. It's the one with the network interfaces on it. An architecture is kind of a definition of what the target is able to do, what's actually programmable on the target. If I bring those two together, now I have a platform. And that's considered a P4 platform. What are the elements of the P4 language? Uh, again, it's a domain specific, so it's not generic. And there's only a few aspects of it that are really important. And I'll go over the six main ones. Of course, we start with parsers. Parsers are finite state machines. Uh, and so it starts, you go through, if you're familiar with a finite state machine, it goes through different states based off various things, headers and things like that. Uh, by the end of it, it either accepts it or it rejects it. So again, kind of computationally bounded. Uh, controls uh, are the parts that give you the tables and the actions. Uh, P4 has switch statements. P4 has if statements, but no while loops, nor for, no for loops. Your usual expressions, greater than, less than, bitwise operators, assignments, comparisons. If you're familiar with programming, usual stuff. Uh, P4 is statically typed. It has, I think, five or six base types, and then I think about 40 derived types. Um, it's all in the specification. Uh, and then another part of it is the architecture description. So as we'll go in the next slide, um, you need to have a description of what it is that is programmable on the device that you're using P4 on. And then the last part is externs. So not everything's programmable, and not every device is the same. If we want to do something like calculate a checksum, uh, the way a device might do a checksum is different. So P4 gives you an extern, a way to reference that checksum, or reference literally anything else. Checksum is just a convenient uh, example. Uh, it provides externs, external interfaces to things that P4 doesn't necessarily represent. So let's look at a P4 program real quick. So we'll go back to my original little thing, shortened here so it works. It's pretty simple. This one here is the vSwitch model. That's an architecture model. So I start off with my parser, parsing stuff. I want to verify the checksum. Once my checksum's good, I go to my egress, ingress pipeline. Tortured example, I want to decrement the TTL. I would do that in my e ingress. My egress could do other things. Once that's all done, I want to compute a new checksum. Then I want to deparse the packet, reassemble it all, and ship it out. Very straightforward. Very easy to grok, in my opinion. This is what the code kind of looks like. So we have, there's a core model, kind of like a libc, if you're familiar with C programming. In this case, and in a lot of the examples, if you look at 
the P4 Association GitHub or just a lot of P4 programs that are floating out there in open source, they tend to uh, gravitate towards the V1 model, which is uh, just a generalized model that you can run in Mininet with the behavioral switch. It's just an architecture model. Uh, we do some declarations, IPv4, what an IPv4 address looks like, 32-bit, some headers. I have my parser, which references some of my declarations. There I have my control flow, like longest prefix match. Then I deparse it. And then that little bit was like, uh, again, to use the C example, my void main or my int main or whatever you want to call it. So all of this P4, what can I do with it? Well, name your pick. You want to do VXLAN, you can do VXLAN. You want to do NVGRE, you can do NVGRE. Uh, there's an interesting paper uh, called DC.P4 where they implement pretty much everything you would expect in data center networking, and they represent it in P4. It's in P4.14, not 16. The differences aren't massive. Uh, don't concern yourself too much with that. Go look at DC.P4, read it, uh, generate some questions. It's, it's an interesting paper, and uh, I found it very illuminating uh, in, in, my, in my course of finding out just how powerful P4 can be. In a P4 environment, there are things you get to do as an operator, and there are things that you rely on from your vendor. So even though P4 gives you a lot of control, you still have to rely on vendors. Oops. What your vendor will give you is an architecture model, a compiler, and that's the very important part. And then, of course, the data plane is whatever you bought from the vendor. What kind of targets currently, right now, support P4? Here is an incomplete list of them. I can do extended Berkeley packet filter. The standard canical uh, development pipeline from the P4 association targets eBPF. So you write a P4 program, you compile it, gets loaded into eBPF on Linux, and it does stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, vector packet processing, uh, another kind of open source uh, software data plane. Uh, there were plans to do it. There was a paper written. The code never came out. It was interesting. It's not, not too exciting. Uh, there's an interesting company called Netcope uh, here in Europe that has uh, an FPGA uh, that supports P4 pretty well. Uh, they give a compiler for it, Xilinx, another FPGA. Uh, you can run P4 on a graphics card, on a GPU, really, and it, it actually works. Uh, there's an open source P4 FPGA one in case you have anything that supports Verilog. Um, Pisces was kind of a proof of concept uh, to take P4 support into Open vSwitch, which everyone knows and loves. Uh, there's a compiler to take P4, more of a transpiler, to take P4 and support DBTK. Uh, there's another one called MaxSAD that uses Open Data Plane plus DBTK. And Netronome makes a smart NIC. It's a many core network interface card. Uh, they have a full featured P4 pipeline. Uh, I hope to have one of those in my lab to play with soon. Um, but here's an incomplete list of stuff that supports P4. Uh, to go back to the Pisces idea, great, so P4 can run on all these things and I can express all this stuff, but really what's the advantage? You know, a lot of people say, Aaron, I don't, I don't want to program my data plane. Why would I want to do that? Who, what, what good does that do for me? Well, okay, fair enough. You don't want to program it. That's fine. But we've all run into bugs from our vendor implementations, and a lot of those bugs come from because there's just so many lines of code. It just takes so much to represent what should be simple, repeatable things. And so in the Pisces example, they went in, and uh, OVS represents a lot of stuff in C. They went in and did it in P4. And as you can see here, uh, in order to add new features, you don't change as many lines, you don't touch as many files, uh, and it takes orders of magnitude less lines of code to express the same thing. And this project is generally performant. I think in some cases it's only 3 or 4% slower than OVS natively. So you don't lose anything from it, and really you only gain, any, gain something from it. There's one component that doesn't really get talked about a lot from P4, only because it hasn't been standardized until recently. P4 runtime is the control plane API interface access to it. So there's P4 to program my data plane, but then how do I have that open and consistent API to the data plane? That's P4 runtime. Uh, it's still sort of in draft status. For all intents and purposes, it's basically finalized. Um, P4 runtime is protobuf based. The actual standard are protobuf files. Uh, it is program independent, so I can change the underlying P4 program and still have the same API calls in order to read counters, read tables, change things. Change the program, still have the same control plane API. Uh, this allows you to be reconfigurable in the field. I can change, if you have a barefoot Tofino, 
top of rack switch. It can go from being an MPLS uh, edge switch to all of a sudden a VXLAN top of route switch in 50 milliseconds or less. In fact, 50 milliseconds is the 99th, 99th percentile uh, latency for changing that kind of stuff. Reconfigurability in the field, pretty neat. What does P4 runtime look like? Uh, gRPC is not really defined by the standard. It's just convenient. You can use whatever you want. Uh, again, the standard is protobuf. Um, the real interesting part, really, is P4 info. The rest of it is as you would expect. But P4 info is kind of where the interesting stuff comes. So in uh, my submission to this, uh, I said P4 and P4 runtime the language itself isn't just for programmable devices. There is value in P4 for fixed function devices. How does that work exactly? P4 runtime gives you a consistent interface. If I have a Broadcom Tomahawk, Jericho, whatever, a fixed function ASIC, I can express the behavior of that fixed function ASIC in P4. Now that I have that behavior in P4, I can run it through a compiler, I can run it through things, and get a P4 info blob, as uh, they sometimes refer to it. Now, that allows me to interact with it, even though it's not programmable. I can grab counters, I can grab metadata. I can understand what my fixed function switch is doing, despite not being able to actually change it. There's a project coming out of ONF called Stratum, and Google and a few other large service providers uh, have been pushing it working on it for quite some time. It's supposed to be generally available sometime by now, but I guess it'll be next year, uh, where they manage both fixed function switches from Broadcom and Mellanox and et cetera, et cetera, and these programmable ASICs from Tofino, all from one unified controller, all from one unified interface. And directly from the P4 runtime specification is that line. Uh, I won't read it. You can find it. P4, P4 runtime, we haven't solved SDN. This isn't the end of it, right? It's a powerful building block. And as you'll see in the next slide, it can get really weird. We can do some interesting things when the network starts getting programmable like this. It is difficult to express scheduling algorithms in P4. It's challenging. It can be done, but it's not easy. So people have come up with higher level abstractions, things that compile down to P4. And two of my favorite ones are Netcat, Network Clean Algebra with Tests, and Domino, uh, a C-like language. Um, you can find both of them on scholar.google.com. Yes, they're academic papers, but they're actually pretty easy to read. Um, the next one is in network computing. And there's a paper with this title, A Dumb Idea Whose Time Has Come. And I'll give you a few examples. I can think of a lot of things I'd like my switch to do than run machine learning models. But someone actually went out there and taught their switches to start doing neural networks. And it actually worked. It's crazy. I'd rather have a switch make me a pizza than do a machine learning uh, model, but uh, whatever. Power of P4. You're not going to replace your Apache Spark event processing pipeline anytime soon and push that off to your top of rack switch, but you can do some things. Uh, and there's an interesting uh, paper out called P4 CEP, excuse me, P4 CEP complex event processing. Again. Another powerful thing with P4. The one I'm most interested in is the next one. Uh, if you've ever run Kubernetes or anything with a distributed database uh, with the Raft protocol and Surf Gossip protocol, um, coordination and consensus is difficult. Now, that's something I would offload to my top of rack switch or to my network. And there is a super, super interesting paper, NetChain. Uh, it's called, they implemented in P4. And basically, you could theoretically, the interface isn't there, but it's not that far apart, you could replace etcd and offload it onto your network completely. And it's kind of insane. They're doing like 2 million key value reads, restores, changes. I'm sorry, 2 billion with a B per second in the network with five switches. Insane. Power P4. The benefits, I found this slide from one of the P4 ones. It's free copyright. I'm allowed to use it. So, um, But create. You know, you get control, you have customization, reliability, you reduce risk by only using the things you need and nothing you don't want. Uh, efficiency probably doesn't really apply to many people. Uh, you know, maybe if you have 10,000 switches, 20,000 switches, saving a few watts here or there is cool. Uh, you can add new features on your schedule. 
be nice not to have to wait for a lot of those vendors out there to come out with stuff when you could implement your own VXLAN or your own artisanal label stack. Uh, telemetry, telemetry, telemetry. Everyone loves telemetry. P4 gets you into the data plane and gives you a lot of telemetry. Um, and one of the other things, everyone in this business is always trying to differentiate themselves. You could conceivably differentiate yourself by having a really nice implementation, a really reliable implementation of whatever protocol you like, and you don't have to share it with anyone else. It's an easy way to differentiate yourself from everyone else. A lot more resources on P4. Uh, Andy Figurehunt from Cisco has a really great guide. If you've been P4 curious at all, I would Definitely start there. Just start clicking on stuff. It's on GitHub. It's got an excellent README. He describes P4 in 500 words or less, uh, if you have a little bit of programming uh, e experience. Uh, the specifications are extremely well written, like OpenBSD documentation well written. Uh, very easy to read, understands a lot of stuff. There are tutorials. There are official tutorials from the P4 Association. They're kind of a work in progress. A lot of the existing tutorials were P414. Newbies really shouldn't spend time with that. so. They're ongoing, but they're still worthwhile. Uh, I have a vanity domain and associated Twitter account. If you're into the whole Twitter thing, go ahead and follow it. I'll be tweeting stuff about P4. Uh, if Twitter is not your thing, email me. A few of you people in the audience know me. I will talk your ear off about P4. It's free. If you have any questions, I love talking about P4 all the time, anytime. Email me. It's totally cool. I will respond. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Aaron. First, first question from me. Sure. What's the cheapest way to get that started at home? Uh, Git clone uh, on the uh, P4Lang uh, GitHub account. There is the P4C uh, Git repository. And then there's a thing called the behavioral model version 2 switch. Uh, check those two things out. Uh, they'll give you some uh, basic starter P4 programs. Uh, you can compile them and see them work. Um, if you want kind of a hand-holding tutorial setup that will take care of all of that for you, go to the uh, tutorials uh, Git re repository. And the very first one starts off with a really, really simple uh, tutorial about flipping a bit in an Ethernet frame. OK. It's a great way to start. Thank you. Any more questions? Gert. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. You, you got me at some point where, where you said there's no loops, which makes sense, mm -hmm. because loops take indefinite time. Mm -hmm. And you calculate a checksum. How, how's that done? Uh, the checksum's so, so not. If you do a checksum, you need to loop over the packet. P4 doesn't do the checksum, right? So checksumming is an external function. So I can call checksum 32CRC, but P4 doesn't express that. P4 doesn't do that. The P4 toolchain doesn't do that. It expects the target to handle that some which way, cool. right? So P4 doesn't have the loop. Something else does. More questions? So uh, I've been following P4 for a while. And I'm curious what you think about commercial applications um, with regarding to data center networking. Or um, I think it will, in the end, be mostly applicable for vendors. Um, and if they will provide you with a compiler, um, either Cisco, Cumulus, or Arista, um, then how will they ever support something like that? So when, when I see someone like Cisco, Juniper, Arista go and say that they support P4, what they're doing is basically providing that P4 info blob. So they're not giving you a compiler. They're not letting you, uh, even though it's a Tofino-based chip for a lot of these, uh, they're not letting you mess with that at all in any which way or form. Uh, so really, when uh, in a commercial aspect, if you're not doing it homegrown, if you're not DIYing it, uh, and you're buying these, these programmable things from these large vendors, all you're really getting is a consistent control plane API to hopefully a deeper visibility into the data plane. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully, you buy that Arista switch, and two, three years later, they can push out a new new code to support new things, just as they would do now with a, a you know a, a, a new control plane image or, or something like that. But it kind of changes the incrementality of it, and it doesn't. It has a consistent interface. That's really all you get. Um, 
Otherwise, the commercial aspect is I go to an original design manufacturer and an OEM, I buy something that has Barefoot Tofino in it or whatever future chips support it, uh, and I write my own P4. When you buy a, a Tofino chip, you get the software development environment from Barefoot. It's free. You just sign an NDA, uh, and you can go nuts. Yeah, sure, but that's exactly what I mean. I think that vendors will provide you with a blob or maybe multiple um, Definitely. Yeah, uh, multiple versions so that they can actually support it. Uh, because if I'm looking for from a vendor perspective, uh, if a customer will program their own ASIC... Yeah, you can't, um, you can't support that. <laughs> uh, you of can't course. support that. Um, so then the people who would write their own P4, um, how would you manage it inside their own network? If you have different ASIC pipelines, um, uh, I have customers asking for uh, for it, and uh, what they're basically saying in the end, they will pro uh, program their own P4, but it will be the same across 99% um, of their network, uh, because otherwise you can't manage that internally as well. Right. So uh, the only people that are really doing the DIY thing and, and managing it and using the same uh, P4 programs across different devices and stuff like that are the people that have large engineering departments to do that. But don't let that stop you. I'd be happy to write P4 programs for anyone in the audience. <laughs> It's a very small fee. I do discounts for P4, so. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>